Luke chapter 15 could be subheaded as parables of the lost. <clears throat> but how many parables are there? Some scholars argue three. Lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son or lost sons. And yet verse 3 says, so he, <clears throat> so he, Jesus, spoke this parable to them saying, and in verse 8 and verse 11, there is no reference to him starting anew or another parable. So all three parables or sections of the same parable have the same or a similar meaning. They talk of something or someone lost and eventually found and all end in joy over a sinner who repents. Now we're mindful to say that the scriptures so often emphasise importance by progression and repetition. So although our subject this afternoon is lost sheep, it would seem unreasonable not to at least touch on what could be the second and third sections of the same parable, that is the lost coin and the lost son. Although I do have much more to say about the lost sheep. And we'll conclude with more to say about sheep and shepherds in general. We need to note at the onset just who Jesus was speaking to and why. Well, he was preaching and working within the house of Israel. His message was heeded by the lower strata of society, termed as tax collectors and sinners. The rulers of the people, the Pharisees, were critical. They were critical of his audience and of the company that he kept. Hence, this parable. These parables, or sections of the one parable, were aimed specifically at them, the Pharisees. So we have the context of what we're saying. A message initially to the house of Israel and not to the world at large. And now, can we suggest in 2018, a message to the aspiring house of believers, to our own community perhaps. No re relevance whatsoever to the non-believer. Perhaps, perhaps not. What we have to say this afternoon is a message and a warning and a wake-up call for ourselves and obviously also to anyone interested in pursuing the truths behind God's word. Now when we really think about it, these stories don't make a lot of sense in human terms. I mean, think about it. What responsible shepherd would leave 99 sheep in the wilderness unattended to go out and search for just one that has gone astray? And also, a sheep doesn't willfully get itself lost. Would the shepherd really put the sheep on his shoulders and carry it home to rejoice with friends and neighbours? it would seem more sensible to take it back to the other 99. The coin is thought to be a Greek drachma or a Roman denarius, both of very little value, although there is some disagreement on this. If indeed it was worth very little, would anyone search the whole house in the middle of the night using a lamp? Surely it would be best to wait for daylight. And which of us on finding a coin of small value would ask our neighbours round for a celebration meal? The coin was lost within the woman's house. She would likely know that and therefore the chances of finding it would be high. And this would hold true whether the coin was of value or not. The father divided his livelihood between his two sons. 
letting one of them go off and spend it. Very, very unlikely. Certainly unusual. Also, what father so concerned about an errant son would stay at home and not go out looking for him? So we ask, even though the three parables or sections are similar, is there a progression? As this may be the case, we will look at them in the order that they appear in Luke chapter 15. And the first section, of course, is the lost sheep, which is our subject for this afternoon. Remember that Jesus is addressing the Pharisees who were not happy with what they termed as him mixing with, receiving, having acquaintance with sinners. Now the lost sheep equates to the one sinner of verse 7 as we have it in Luke chapter 15. The same verse refers to 99 just persons who need no repentance. So who are these people? Who are these people who do not need to repent? Who can claim to be just? And that word just, the original Greek word for just, means righteous. Who believe that there is nothing to repent over. Let's just look at a couple of scriptures. I'll quote the first one to you. It's from Matthew 23. And it's Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men. But inside, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Just turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. Very, very similar to what we've just quoted. Mark 2, verse 16. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw Jesus eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so it's obvious to us that the just, righteous people who had no need to repent equates to Pharisees and scribes. The 99 sheep are the Pharisees. They don't need saving as they don't believe that in any way they are lost. The lost sheep is a man or a woman who acknowledges, after coming to recognize that they are sinful and unworthy, that they are in need of redemption. They were once a part of the 99, but have moved on to be found by Christ. Lost in the world, but now found. So what can we parallel with the Pharisees from today's world, the age in which we are now living? Now remember the 99 sheep are said to be in the wilderness, it says in verse 4, and we know that the children of Israel perished in the wilderness. Now the nearest thing that we can suggest we can't be dogmatic about this is that there is a mentality abroad in our society which is often voiced and I've heard people say this more than once I've heard people say I'm a good person I am I'd never do anything really bad I live a good life good clean life I'm always honest and I'll do anyone a good turn I always help people in trouble but I don't need to go to church or get involved in religion. I'm a good person, I am. So if someone says 
that they are not sinful they are part of the 99 just like the Pharisees they needed no repentance who are the friends and neighbours who rejoice over the lost sheep when found well we're told it was the angels God's angels let's read verse 7 I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance this parable this section of the parable is about the need for repentance we need to know and to recognize that without Christ in our lives we are lost and we are sinful and when a sinner repents it is like a lost sheep being found he alone can help the sheep repent and thus achieve forgiveness of sins one important last thing to note about the lost sheep before we move on to briefly look at the lost coin and the lost son it's significant that the lost sheep is not is not returned to the 99 but is taken or more so is carried to the man's home in effect the repentant sinner who has joined himself to Christ who is the true shepherd and he now dwells with others who also belong to Christ we cannot be found by Christ until we acknowledge that we are sinful and we repent the second parable or the second section is the lost coin and we read of this woman who had lost one of her ten pieces of silver most commentators think that the woman is symbolic of the church the ecclesia the community the coin no matter what its value was lost now again the coin would not have wandered off on its own coins don't do that it was the woman the ecclesia who had lost the coin presumably through her own carelessness lack of care and so perhaps we can liken the parable of the lost coin to someone still a member of the community but only in a tenuous way we know of course that we must each work out our own salvation whatever mistakes other people may have made however it would seem that the ecclesia to an extent was the cause of the problem certainly so in the eyes of the one fast losing interest initially the community had not seen the problem or done anything about it the darkness of the world was affecting the ecclesia and the house was in darkness but to use modern parlance they got their act together and they got their act together in the very best way possible they let the light of Jesus Christ the light of the gospel shine brightly into the corners of darkness and the lost coin was found the brothers and the sisters rejoiced and that equates to the woman her friends and her neighbours verse 10 likewise I say to you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents the third parable or third section is the lost son but remember a certain man had two sons I think that's very important and I think we should always think of that a man had two sons it's a parable of the lost sons now if our analogy of the lost coin is correct 
Then the father represents God. The house, was it a large farmstead? It seems that way. Equates to the church, the ecclesia, the community. And the son who leaves home is someone who has known an accepted truth in the past and has now decided to turn his back on his father, on his God, to go out into the outside world to seek his fortune elsewhere or more likely just to have a good time. After all, life is just about us enjoying ourselves. Is it? Isn't it? Let's read verses 14 and 15. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now the word joined that we have there in verse is it 15 uh, is the exact same word as when it records elsewhere as being joined to a harlot. He went from the state of being found and chose himself to become lost even though he was aware, and this is really significant, he was aware of all the blessings of the father's house. He wanted out. He wanted to enjoy himself right now. Now, just, just a reminder, the father divided all his substance between the two sons. The father, God, let him go. He didn't interfere with his free will. God will bring a person, as we have it here, into a pigsty both to chasten and to bring low, giving them a chance to come to their senses and hopefully repent. A lesson for us, like the Father, we must rush out and meet anyone with a repentant attitude anyone with a genuine repentant attitude and is this why we're introduced to the brother the other son angry and with no compassion towards his repentant brother oblivious to the fact that we all remain sinful and require ongoing repentance just think what, he, what did he say to his father it's almost unbelievable I have never transgressed your commandments at any time. Is there a connection here? We suggested that the 99 sheep were perhaps those in the world who think that they are basically good. Does the brother, the, el the other son, the eldest son, represent the self-righteous? Perhaps amongst the ecclesia the community it's a very worrying possibility isn't it it is Christ who seeks and first calls the lost and the truly repentant and he is the one who is truly the light of the world so let us in the last section of our remarks Think about the amazing love of the Good Shepherd. The famous hymn based on Psalm 23 says that the Lord is my shepherd. And it was written by King David, who himself was once a shepherd. Our modern way of life prevents us from fully understanding these words. Now... There is a now famous shepherd who operates in the Lake District and who writes about his work and he's written several books about the way he conducts and how he looks after the sheep and he's, he's made himself a very, very wealthy man but he still has continued as a shepherd. And the methods he uses are thousands of years old 
and so are similar to those described in the Bible. And here are some of the points that he makes. Despite its romantic image, shepherding is gruelling work. The routine is determined totally by the needs of the sheep. Some activities like shearing are financially loss-making but are beneficial for the sheep. The shepherd finds conditions in which the sheep will thrive. He goes out in all weather conditions risking his own safety in order to protect them. He is especially vigilant when they are lambing lambs or orphans and he knows ewes and their daughters individually by their characteristics and he once bought a ram which is called a tup apparently against the advice of his fellow shepherds because unlike them he could see his great potential now in the days of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac and Jacob shepherding was important work but in later times it became a menial job suitable only for the working class but it was certainly not easy shepherds spent all of their time outside watching the sheep and protecting them from weather wild animals or thieves they made sheepfolds to protect the sheep and ensured that the entrance was always guarded they regularly counted their flock and it was and still is common for the shepherds to have names for individual sheep. They always ensured that the sheep had enough food and at certain times in the year in Israel this was not easy as the hot sun scorched the land and there was little or no green grass. It was also important to locate suitable watering places, pools or wells where the sheep could drink without fear. And of course we know from the 23rd Psalm, he makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. The shepherd would not take his flock to new pastures until, until he was sure that they were all present. And in the Middle East, he always led them. When several flocks came together and they needed to be separated, the sheep recognised the voice and the distinctive call of their shepherd. Such was the dedication of shepherds. Unlike modern day Western shepherds, they worked alone without tractors and without a sheepdog, however difficult or dangerous the situation. And I think these descriptions are very poignant when we read the Bible, because many such practices are alluded to in the accounts of the Jewish shepherds. More importantly, God describes his people as sheep and criticises the false leaders for misleading them and for not protecting them spiritually. We could spend much time in the prophecies of Ezekiel chapter 34 and Zechariah chapter 11 looking into what is termed as false shepherds. In contrast, God himself promised to look after his sheep. The prophet Isaiah also promised that there would be a faithful and a dedicated shepherd for Israel. Isaiah 40 says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And so finally we think about the very best, the very best human shepherd. Jesus said that he was the good shepherd who made the ultimate sacrifice for the sheep, for his sheep. Just turn with me to John, John's Gospel and chapter 10. <coughs> John chapter 10 
and we'll read from verse 11 through to verse 15. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So just keep your fingers in that chapter with another few verses to read in it in a second. Moreover, in his darkest hour, when facing intense suffering, Jesus had no earthly help. Matthew 26 says, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And yet previously, he had also described the response of his true flock in the first four verses of this chapter. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way the same as a thief and a robber but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out and when he brings out his own sheep he goes before them and the sheep follow him and they know his voice the good shepherd had a dedication to and a, a passion for his sheep and against this background we can never ever say that God doesn't care for us he has done absolutely everything absolutely everything to offer us salvation not willing that any should perish Second Peter says, but that all should come to repentance. Notwithstanding the efforts of the most conscientious shepherd, some sheep do die, especially when they wander away from the rest of the flock. Similarly, if we do not obey the shepherd's voice, we put ourselves in eternal peril. So let us remember what the Good Shepherd has done and still offers to do and is still doing for us. And let us resolve to listen to him and to follow him. Thank you.